All right, so it's about uh, 10 in the morning, a few minutes before 10 in the morning, on December 30th, uh, 2017. And I'm heading north on the road that will soon, in a few feet, merge with East Marginal Way, which is a north-south highway um, <clears throat> in Seattle. And just up ahead, is Boeing Field. It's off on the right. And I'm going to visit the Boeing Museum of Flight today. been here a few times before and it, each time I come here it's bigger or at least substantially changed mile, around turn right on the alley So here we are at Boeing Field, and of course the Museum of Flight is just behind us here. That's Interstate 5 right there. here is quite a famous airport um, really just belongs to Boeing although I think they do use it for some other things it looks like some UPS planes down there but uh, the first flights of many of the older Boeing aircraft took place from this runway I'm not positive but I gather that the factories where they were assembled would have been here at the same time, that seems likely. Of course now Boeing's uh, facilities uh, in the Seattle area are up in the Everett um, region north of Seattle, but there are still a lot of hangars and factory type buildings surrounding Boeing Field, and a lot of research and experimental stuff happens here. But if you look and see a lot of those earlier flights, I seem to recall that the first flight of the B-52, for example, took place from this runway. And you can see pictures of it, or videos of it, taking off with the same backdrop, with the trees on the hill and so on. Um, <clears throat> so it should just about be open now. I had gotten here a couple minutes early. There's actually some sun today. Maybe it'll clear up more. The prediction was for a 20% chance of rain today at some point, but it doesn't appear it's going to be as wet as yesterday was.
I always get a kick out of some of these older airplanes by today's standards how simple the landing gear is. Just look like sticks. This is a gatekeeper out here. They, it says a few things. First, it's a spectacular airplane to have in front of any aircraft museum. And uh, even though this is a Boeing facility and Museum of Flight is run by Boeing or owned by Boeing, uh, the Lockheed Constellation, of course, is by a different manufacturer. So. It's also saying It's also saying, hey, we're not just a Boeing museum. This is a world-class aircraft museum and uh, you're not just going to see Boeing products here. here before they did not have that uh, facility across the highway and I can see that it looks like it's ready for business so that'll greatly expand the amount of museum space to see today and that looks like a Dreamliner in there that may be the prototype we'll find out I did see the prototype before it was the last time I visited this museum and at that point it was parked right out here where this parking lot was and the cars were parking elsewhere and I had a private tour just by the roll of the dice really a private one-on-one -on -one tour of that uh, prototype Dreamliner 787 um, from one of the two pilots who flew it on its maiden flight which was very cool so let's go inside. Looks like general admission is $23 per adult, $14 for kids. So I'm going to do a walkthrough of the museum, similar to ones I've done for the Smithsonian Air and Space and the uh, National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton. Um, starting off here with the famous Red Barn. The Red Barn is the relocated original facility where Boeing got its start. It has a number of appropriate artifacts in it. And as with so many factories of the era, there was a single power plant for the entire factory and had overhead shafts which ran along and then pulleys were dropped down to each machine tool. So we have a table saw. planer for changing the thickness of boards. And this was an example of a uh, type of power plant they would have used. This is a Fairbanks Morse six horsepower gas engine.
and a jointer. I think this guy's mispositioned. I think his hands should be on the wood. <laughs> a bandsaw. Without a blade installed at the moment. The red barn was a flexible workspace. Um, they could reallocate the space to assemble airplanes or do machining or any number of things required depending on which contracts they were awarded and had to work on. So they, according to this, they mostly had the power tools at one end and then kept the rest of the space uh, mobile and versatile, as it says here. No one knew what the next job would be. Boeing, of course, started out as a timber company before Mr. Boeing decided that he would take his uh, chances uh, he thought he could build an airplane at least as well or better than the other companies that were doing it. So there's various small exhibits here relating to the early days. This is a um, Boeing Model C. It's a reproduction. Have the basic wooden frame, then with tensioned guy wires. Um, providing for the various stresses. Very lightweight wooden strap chair for the pilot. Very direct pulley operation for the controls. And then we have the front seat, uh, which has, at least in this instance, basic flight controls but no instrumentation. And the heavy engine mounts. And the Hall Scott A7A inline engine. appears to be a pontoon structure. And of course there's a wood lathe here representing that particular tool. I had been chatting with a docent a few minutes ago and he said this is in fact the original Boeing building. It's not a reproduction and it was um, up north of Seattle or one of the rivers, I forget which one he said it was, uh, uh, comes into Puget Sound. And um, it eventually passed over to the Port Authority of Seattle and they wanted the land but not the building and so it was dismantled and, and brought here and it was the first structure at the Museum of Flight when they first decided to have a museum here. And he pointed out that the building is mostly original, but of course, you know, they had to replace some wood here and there. And he pointed out all these pillars are sawed off here because um, originally it was just on a dirt floor. 
and very close to the water and everything was rotted out. Um, so they cut them off to the point where they weren't rotted and then spliced in the new um, beams and, and pillars. And so, old wood, new wood. Oops, they just had a nice picture of the building being moved. Looks like it was brought over intact. I thought it was taken apart, but... It was the Duwamish River that was mentioned. And this is what they considered to be Plant One, starting in 1918. You have the red barn there, and then the larger hangars and machine shops, design facilities. And that um, Model C that we looked at earlier was the um, plane that Boeing was contracted to build for the Navy. And this is a Boeing Model 40B, 40B from 1928. This would have been their own design. And then it's a uh, metal skinned aircraft with welded uh, tubing frame and wooden stringers. I'm not uh, certain from this, but it looks like the part in between would have been fabric covered and then these other parts being um, metal skinned. This one had a um, male and or passenger compartment up front. Pilot back in the middle and out in the elements. A notion that persisted for a long time that the pilot should somehow be outdoors and not inside where it's dry and clear. does have an upstairs which would have been used for uh, engineering purposes and probably other office type purposes as well some of the uh, early years types of airplanes Although I wouldn't call the Model 247 all that early. On something on the XB-15 Experimental Bomber. The XB-15, which ended up becoming the B-17 type aircraft in general. There are a couple scale models of the Model 247 Boeing against the Douglas DC-3. Comparable sized airplanes, but the Douglas was definitely a, a much better airplane in so many ways. At least as a passenger airplane. And you have the Model 307 Stratoliner world's first four-engine passenger plane with a pressurized cabin and that I believe was based on the B-17 wing and tail but with a different fuselage and then of course the 314 clipper used for mostly for trans-pacific flights but it got some use during the war 
for example, here, President Roosevelt in a 314. number of uh, tools used by people building airplanes during World War II. There's a couple scale models of the B-17 and the B-29. This uh, B-29 is marked up as Fifi from the Confederate or Commemorative Air Force. And this is a uh, turbo supercharger from a, I think from the B-17, yeah, from the B-17. wind tunnel models of the B-17. And um, another aircraft. This is the AE-106. It's um, an engineering study model, not a specific airplane. gallery on the C-97 and 377 Stratocruiser. And on the B-47 and B-52. This is a uh, B-52 pilot's instrument panel with a lot of the parts removed. And the Dash 80, which is the prototype of the 707 type of design, although earlier and smaller and the KC-135, which is the cargo version of the aircraft. display here on Tex Johnston who played a, a big part in convincing people that the Dash 80 design was a game changer and a worthy aircraft. One of his stunts was flying the Dash 80 upside down for an air show at the um, Seattle area. Famous picture there. And I would guess that's some of Tex Johnston's stuff. I actually met Tex once. Did a nice job writing his autobiography. Very interesting book. And uh, 
he signed a copy for me, which I really am pleased to have. His cowboy boots. <laughs> and one of his flight helmets. Alright, let's get on to the rest of the museum. Okay, leaving the red barn. Going to go back through the lobby and to the great gallery. Our annual holiday tradition continues with daily dose of lunch tours of the empty blackbird and home for Christmas, the USO show story on Saturdays. The USO show will be at 11 o'clock in the World War II gallery, located in personal courage wing, and will be repeated again at 1 o'clock. We live the good times the USO provided with music for our troops on the front lines from World War II through the Vietnam War. The Tip to Tail Tour will also be at 11 o'clock in the T.D. Wilson Great Gallery. You will learn all about this unique variant of the A-12, the earliest blackbird type. This is a 45-minute tour and will be repeated again at 2 o'clock. Happy holidays and thank you for visiting the Museum of Flight. Up over here in the lobby are reproductions of some uh, very early aircraft. Uh, that one was probably never built. That was one of Leonardo da Vinci's uh, drawings that here they've turned into an actual uh, full-scale model. You've got a uh, Chanute uh, hang glider and the uh, Lilienthal monoplane and uh, the Wright glider. I believe this is the Rumpler Taube reproduction. Note to Museum of Flight documentation people. It's one thing to have numbered circles that relate to a menu of aircraft types but it's much more useful to have an outline of the airplane drawn to scale. It helps people get oriented, especially when there's a bunch close together. There used to be a uh, gossamer albatross hanging up here, and I don't see it. Don't know if they took it out or relocated it or what. This is a reproduction of the right flyer. And I can see absolutely nothing saying what this airplane is. I don't see a sign for it. Oh, maybe this one way over here identifies it. Let's see. It's way over in front, that's the thing. Okay, this is a Boeing model 40B, and we saw the um, open frame version of that in the red barn with the skin missing and no wings. And that up there should be a Boeing B&W replica. Uh, that may be a Lamson L106 Alcor. This is apparently called the Swallow Commercial. It's a little hard to identify these positively from the uh, menu they give you. And that should be a Ryan M1 
and it does look like a Ryan aircraft. US mail truck. And over there is a Cessna CG2 glider. And that's the um, McAllister Yakima Clipper. And as a person who likes Heath kits for the electronics, that's um, Heath's airplane kit that they made, one of their earliest kits. And that's their parasol, the Heath parasol. And a Douglas DC-3. Ah, okay. Now I found the Gossamer Albatross. It was right above me, but not in the place I was looking for it. Human-powered uh, aircraft that was basically a competition to see who could build the first human-powered aircraft that would uh, meet certain criteria for performance and duration of flight. This should be the um, Boeing AGM 86B air launch cruise missile. It's a mock-up and just over here is the Fiesler FI-103 cruise missile from World War II, better known as the V-1. And this is the Lockheed Martin RQ-3A, otherwise known as the Dark Star. And there is um, a Lear personal uh, aircraft. This one's called the Lear Fan. It has a propeller on it in the rear. And over here we have a Lockheed F-104C Starfighter. And behind is a Sikorsky uh, HH-52A Sea Guard helicopter. And that's a uh, Stevens Acro acrobatic or aerobatic airplane. And there's a Northrop YF-5A Freedom Fighter. And there's a Bowers Flybaby 1A. And over there is a Piper J3 Cub. And there's a Beach C-45H, otherwise known as the D-18. And the Aranka Grasshopper. It's a little hard to get pictures of the ones hanging up high because with all the glass everything is backlit. And I don't have any good way of illuminating those from the front. This is the Boeing Model 80A-1. And of course we have a Lockheed Blackbird. This is an M21. It's the version that was set up to carry the drone. 
And then right above it, attached to it, we have the Lockheed D-21B drone. This particular Electra has some notoriety. This one was uh, modified by and flown by Linda Finch uh, to replicate and spiritually complete Amelia Earhart's uh, final and incomplete flight. Uh, she had it painted and modified to very closely match uh, the one that Earhart flew in her around the world attempt uh, with a few safety enhancements. And on the 60th anniversary of the start of Earhart's attempt, uh, her first attempt to fly around the world, uh, in 1997 this is, she followed Earhart's road as closely as possible, had to make a few changes, flew north around Africa to avoid the ongoing civil war in Sudan and made a few extra stops while crossing the Pacific. She could not land at Howland Island, but did drop a wreath as she passed the island to honor Earhart's memory. So, this one's been around the world. Here's another view of the Beach C-45H. And the F-104 and some of the other planes we saw from the front earlier on. This is a MiG-15. And by the way, there's one of the uh, aircraft marked up as the Blue Angels on a uh, pylon outside. This is a MiG-21 on the floor and the cockpit section of a SR-71, which you can actually go and sit in. And this is a Canadair-built um, Sabre Mark VI. U-1 Crusader. I still think that the front of this airplane is one of the coolest looking I've seen on any type of uh, fighter. To me it just works, it clicks, but then the whole rest of the airplane is blah. <laughs> Down on the floor here we have the Bell UH-1H Iroquois, otherwise known as the Huey. And over there is the McDonnell F-4C Phantom II. And this is a DG-505M Perlan glider marked up with NASA markings for whatever reason. There's a little gallery over there called the Flight Zone. It's really uh, set up for kids. This whole area is more like a learning center for kids up in that area.
This is the J58 engine start cart. Mute, meet the Buick. <laughs> this is what was used to start the engines on the uh, SR71 Blackbird. Used two Buick Wildcat V8 automobile racing engines side by side through a series of gears. The two Buick engines drive a vertical shaft connected to one of the Blackbird's J-58 aircraft engines. These Buicks have no mufflers and full throttle is needed to crank the engine to a starting speed of 3200 RPM. The noise is deafening. particular YO3A is a nearly silent observation aircraft. Use the plane to spot nighttime enemy activity and direct artillery fire during the Vietnam War. Used an ultra-efficient airframe based on a Schweitzer SGS 2-32 glider. So this is the Williams X-Jet from 1974, a one-man vertical takeoff and landing system. It's controlled just by leaning in the direction of the desired uh, travel, of, uh, travel direction and adjusting the power. It can be made to move in any direction, accelerate rapidly, hover and rotate on its axis. It can stay aloft for up to 45 minutes and travel at speeds up to 60 miles an hour. This is a proof of concept example and flew numerous test flights and is displayed exactly as it was after its final flight. Uh, I think though that it probably had a human in it instead of a mannequin. And this is a Taylor Aero Car Model 3. Underneath the SR-71 here. This is the cockpit from a Northrop FA-18L Hornet. Put your hand on the gears like you're flying. Yeah. Come on. Are you ready? 
That's one of the few places I've seen a cutaway of a wet wing as used on commercial aircraft showing the relative thickness of the wing skin material. Fairly thick, but it does have to have a lot of structural strength. And then the ribbing. And uh, then the whole open area is used for containment of fuel. signage here for the Fieseler FI-103, otherwise known as the V-1, first cruise missile. And in this little squeaker right up here, this is the Boeing AGM-86B air launch cruise missile. Well, this isn't. This one is over here. Let's see. And this is another view of the Boeing AGM-86B air launch cruise missile. It's a mock-up of it. Um, we saw that from below earlier. And this little squeaker is the Aerosond Laima, airborne weatherman, and the Scan Eagle, portable observer. This is a example of the Schmidt Rohr um, AS109014 Argus engine. This is the engine used in the buzz bomb. Or the V1. Turn on the 
No running. Excuse me. Hey buddy, you ready to go see the other airplanes? Lots of people, please. Oops, excuse me. Are these the jump seats, Marco? This is a Pratt Reed PRG1 glider. This is one of the smaller side exhibits dedicated to the Apollo program. one of the F1 engines as used on the Saturn V first stage. This is uh, the remains of an F-1 engine uh, after the first stage fell back to uh, land in the ocean. And the pieces are arranged as they would be for the top part. The engine bell itself was totally crushed, so only these other parts uh, remained more or less intact. This is the uh, fuel injector from an F1. One of my favorite YouTube bloggers or V bloggers. And this is a model of the lunar roving vehicle. It's not a real one. This was a uh, piece of moon rock collected by the Apollo 12 mission. And this is a mock-up of the Apollo portable life support system backpack. And this is an Apollo command module number 007A. It's originally called CM007. It's the very first production line Apollo command module delivered to NASA and was used as a test vehicle. 
to be 52 weeks. That's the next. So we can just go on and And a uh, mock-up of the ascent stage of the lunar landing module. And this is a spare Viking lander uh, module or capsule. And here we have some scale models of the Redstone rocket. These are all 172nd scale. I've got a 172nd scale um, Saturn V rocket at home. At least it's supposed to be 172nd scale, but it seems to me it's a bit smaller than this, so maybe I remember incorrectly. Pretty close to the same size, though. Anyway, a uh, redstone rocket, an Atlas rocket, a Titan II, and of course the redstone and the Atlas were used for the Mercury missions, and the Titan was used for the Gemini missions. Then you got a Saturn 1B, which was used for the uh, smaller Apollo missions when they didn't have to uh, carry as much stuff up or achieve the same uh, velocities. And then of course the Saturn V which was used for the missions that actually went to the moon. And it's about time for lunch. And they have a decent sized gift shop here. There's a big line of people it looks like trying to get into the into the diner here. doesn't look that bad.
Up next is the J. Elroy McCaw Personal Courage Wing. Here's a Supermarine Spitfire LF Mark 9. And a Messerschmitt BF 109E3. Up here is a Lockheed P-38L Lightning. Located across the Sky Bridge on the West Campus. Joseph Ken Smith will discuss current aerospace topics and space news. Short videos will be shown about this past week's launches. This is a 15-minute talk. Happy holidays and thank you for visiting the Museum of Flight. And this is a Curtis P-40 in Warhawk. And this is a Nakajima KI-43 3A Hayabusa. This is a General Motors built FM2 Wildcat designed by Grumman, built by General Motors. And this is the Chance Vought FG-1D Corsair. This example built by Goodyear, as so many of them were. Pratt & Whitney R2808W engine core with most of the cylinders removed. An example of pierced steel planking used for runways in primitive areas could be brought in in small panels by cargo aircraft or ships and assembled to make a usable runway and ramp area for aircraft. 
This is a Republic P47D Thunderbolt. And this is a Yakovlev Yak 9U. and a North American P-51D Mustang. So these were World War II fighter aircraft, and on the second floor is a gallery of World War I aircraft. As they point out, it's because those are lighter and make more sense to be upstairs. And this is just an overhead view of the first floor gallery. And this is a Caproni CA20. Some nice displays relating to the use of balloons. And this is a Fokker E3 Eindecker monoplane, is essentially what that means. This is a Royal Aircraft Factory SE-5A. And a Sopwith triplane. Aircraft and also in defense of London against the 
And up here is a Sopwith Pup. This is an Albatross DVA. And there's a Fokker DR1 triplane. There's a Newport Type 27. And down here is a Newport Type 24. Here's an Aviatic D1. This is uh, from the Austro-Hungarian branch of the German Aviatic Company. Interesting camouflage scheme on there. This is a Newport Type 28 and a SPAD 13. Lesson to the curator of a couple of the hangars at the National Museum of the United States Air Force see my other video on that, but note to the curators, you can have theatrical and dramatic lighting of vintage aircraft without having them be in total darkness. Come see this place, learn how it's done. And this is a Curtis JN4D, better known as the Jenny. And up above is a Sopwith 7F1 Snipe. This one's a reproduction. And this is a false D12. <laughs> I like that comment by Frank Tallman. Like most German aircraft of the period, to get into the cockpit you have to have been sired by giraffes or have a ladder. Really nice model of a Zeppelin. This is the Zeppelin L30 model. They've even got the detailed rigging, which is going to be hard to see here for the tail surfaces. There we go. Got the tail gunner. Very detailed.
the rear gondola. In this instance, the engines are in that pod, and then they just have a drive shaft going up the side with radiators up on the strutting instead of having the engines out here exposed to the elements as was done on some other Zeppelin type aircraft. It's a really nice job on this. Again, enclosed engines. Another enclosed engine at the rear of the command gondola. Nice job of modeling, guys. And over here is a Fokker D8. in a very dramatic pose. And that concludes a quick walk around of this gallery. <clears throat> they had some guys upstairs pretending to be soldiers. And now we've got a live act down here. That might be a perk of coming here on a Saturday. I'm not sure they have that on weekdays. And then through the T. Evans Wyckoff or Wyckoff Memorial Bridge. which, by the way, is open air. On this side, it's got glass, but it's not really sealed. And this side, it's only got partial glass up to the safety level, and then it's open air. see a preview of the aviation pavilion over there. Which is open air but covered more or less from the elements.
this bridge is set up so it can also be used as just a simple walkway across this highway. There are bus stops here. <clears throat> Both sides of the road. And there's auxiliary parking or overflow parking behind these uh, pavilions and galleries on this side of the road. So this is the Charles Simony Space Gallery. space shuttle trainer which requires a special admission to get into it there was a, uh, a maintenance test explosion uh, of a single, a single engine failure of a uh, AC. This is a ground radar surveillance aircraft. Different concept were, models uh, for shuttle type aircraft or spacecraft. And whenever they had the explosion, they did damage to five of the aircraft. So this is like a third of our fleet of these ground uh, radar sensing uh, surveillance aircraft. So they're all going to be in for repairs. This is a this is a, a, a great video. This is a, you may remember that uh, Bruce McCann has passed away on December the 21st. You may not be familiar with his name, but you're going to be familiar with the image that you're going to see here very very soon. This is from 1984. He's wearing a backpack, man maneuvering unit. He's leaving the Space Shuttle Challenger, and you're going to see an image of him here in just a second with the Earth in the background. This is one of these classic images. Here it is right here. There are two images that I'll always remember. This is one and the other uh, is uh, Alvin Shepard hitting, hitting a golf ball on the moon. Remember, you may well remember when he hit a golf ball, it was his thousand, it was maybe not the a six iron, he called it his thousand yard sand shot. These are great images. And this is our summary slide. I'm not standing around. Uh, Boeing and every year we're looking at a uh, possible conversion here at some point acquisition at some point here in the future. I don't know that they made a final decision on this, but it's still being evaluated. Uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, Rupert Grumman are uh, both the same. Was incorrect that you have to pay extra as long as you've paid admission you're allowed to go through this without paying an additional fee <clears throat> I think what I was thinking of was they were talking about guided tours <laughs> This is a full-size scale model of the scaled composite Spaceship One. I think the original one is in the uh, museum, the National Air and Space Museum. Richard 
इसी कंपनी वर्जन वर्जन एसाजी भी उसकी है लेकिन वर्जन गलेक्टिक इसकी है ये हमारे मुकाबले में इसने बनाया था कि इसमें एक पायलट बैठेगा पीछे लोग बैठेंगे और ये इतना ऊपर जाएगा कि उधर ना वेट लॉस वैसे की आ जाएगी और एक टिकट की कीमत ज़्यादा रखी होती है And that's a, uh, I believe it's a half-scale model of the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> uh, there's a separate stairway there for exiting. <laughs> ah, that's where the mix-up came in. It's the cargo compartment or the bay, which is just open with normal admission, but if you want to take the crew compartment, it's by tour only. That was the trick. play with this for a while if you want to see the 3D views of the inside of the crew compartment. of um, SD's model rockets and similar things. Model missiles, Arrow B. Century Black Widow. Booster Vision min Mini Gear Cam. Various rocket engines telemetry units. As previously mentioned, this is basically open air, but it does have the uh, roof over it. So we start off with a uh, partially covered up uh, B-17. It's got some protection for the weather in here, but it is the B-17 Flying Fortress. This is an F model. Up here we have one of the Concords. We'll take a look at that later. I believe we can walk through it. So this is the uh, B-29 Super Fortress. And over a 
across the way is the Boeing 247D, which had a similar design in many ways to the B-17, but was intended as a commercial transport for passengers. A very modern airplane for its time, but it's still stuck with some sort of antiquated or not fully thought through ideas. One of which was uh, having a center wing, essentially. You can see how tall the fuselage is and where the wing is. And so right in the middle of the passenger cabin was this huge obstruction going through the center of the wing that people had to climb up and over and there wasn't enough room above the wing to stand up so you'd have to hunch and that would make the whole thing very awkward. Also not much good for cargo if you decided to carry cargo in it. Contrast that with the DC-3, which had a taller design and the wing structure was underneath the cabin floor, so it did not obstruct cargo or passenger access. And this is the uh, Boeing WB-47E Stratojet. I'm sorry, this is actually a DC-2, not a DC-3. Very similar design, but a little bit smaller. The wing's a little bit shorter, and the uh, fuselage is narrower <clears throat> than the DC-3. Otherwise, a very similar airplane. And here we have one of the 787 Dreamliners. I think the fellow on the other side said this was one of the uh, three first ones built, possibly the first one to fly. Let's go over and take a look. Yeah, this aircraft was the third Dreamliner off the production line. It served as a test aircraft and made its first flight in 2010. And I somehow still have not managed to get on a flight with a 787. You just have to fly to wherever they're going to and fly back on one. Oh, 
points out how many different places around the world that furnish parts for the 787. A lot of parts from Japan. The wings, the fixed trailing edge, the wingtips are from South Korea, the flap support fairings, uh, nacelles are out of the U.S., tail fins by Boeing, aft fuselage by Boeing, horizontal stabilizer out of Italy, the rudders out of China, aft fuselage out of South Korea, passenger doors made in France, main landing gear not <clears throat> wheel well assembly by uh, Kawasaki in Japan. The main fuselage sections are by Boeing, center fuselage out of Italy, A lot of parts made in Japan. Cargo doors out of Sweden. Wing and body fairings out of Canada. Displays pointing out the window sizes of some other aircraft. the aft galley. My understanding is most of these have some sort of a hidden place for the crew to duck away. Often upstairs, sometimes through a hidden panel in the galley. I have no idea how it's done on this plane. And this is a uh, 7, 737 down here, a uh, fairly early one. It doesn't have the larger engines hanging down below. This is actually, uh, according to the brochure, this is the prototype of the 737.
This particular is the prototype and the first one built, which is essentially the same thing. But sometimes they play games with that terminology in relation to test artifacts that are designed to be torn apart and first ones to fly and so on, and they're not always in the same order. So it's nice to clarify that terminology. I think this is the same one I saw here when I was at this museum several years ago when it was parked out in the uh, parking lot on the other side of the main museum. sure what they have going on here. <laughs> Looks like they might have had a kids play area in here that they've dismantled. Well, uh, let's take a look at this guy over here. This is an Antonov AN2 Colt. And there's a Grumman F-14 Tomcat. and a Grumman EA-6B Prowler and a Grumman A-6E Intruder and a McDonnell Douglas AV-8C Harrier This is a uh, Douglas A4F Skyhawk. And down here with its wings folded is a Grumman F9 F8 Cougar. This is the tail end of a Boeing 727. Used to love flying on these, but I don't know if there's any still flying. If there are, there may be a few in special service or test applications, maybe a couple of cargo airlines still operating them. There's the thrust reverser on this engine. And this 747, by the way, is the prototype, number one. I wonder if this is the same one that I went to see in St. Louis when I was a kid. We were there very briefly, just a couple of years, in between living in Japan and living in Europe. And uh, my mother, who was always a big fan of large airplanes, uh, took me into St. Louis Lambert Field to see the visit of the 747. And it was supposed to be the first one, but I don't know if it really was. Certainly a very early one. Seems to me it was painted up about like this. But whether it was the prototype or not, that's another matter. Yeah, I believe that it had full seating and everything inside of it, which is not something you'd usually expect to see on a prototype.
One of the cool things about the 727 is that its wings were designed differently from most Boeing commercial aircraft, jet aircraft that is, uh, in that they had extra flight surfaces to allow it to operate out of shorter fields than most of the other ones. So they had the extra slats along the front of the wings that most of the other ones did not have. You can really see everything deployed here. While we're walking around here, they've got a FedEx display. The 727 aircraft previously used by FedEx had two lower cargo compartments or bellies one forward and one aft of the wing. Due to the small size of the compartment doors, the bellies are primarily used for bulk loading of packages, documents, and small freight. Their location on the lower part of the aircraft allowed for easy acceptance of late arriving packages and for offloading quickly at intermediate or final destinations. In addition, the packages could be separated from the remaining load if needed. Using the bellies allowed FedEx to maximize all available cargo space and ensure a cost-efficient flight. <laughs> all right, back to the 747 here. One thing to note about the Museum of Flight <clears throat> is that it's not a public museum like the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum or the Museum, National Museum of the United States Air Force or some other ones. This is a private museum and unlike many of the others it does charge admission. I already mentioned that going in but it is a distinction to make. One of the docents mentioned that for a normal size family of four, you'd be spending $100 to come here. Although, I think that presumes that the kids are old enough to not get kids' rates. So this... Uh, the plane does not have all the trappings and interior panels. And of course, when this was made, they still use control cables for everything, so the control cables are visible up there. Wiring, ducting. Insulation panels. And of course on the 747, this is the main passenger deck and the pilots were up in the bubble above. So you can see all these cables converging from the back of the airplane and then you've got these pulleys right here where everything turned a corner and went upstairs into the cockpit. Some of these uh, bell cranks up here are apparently associated with the pedals. Today, what year? I was there in 72. And the avionics bay is visible down there. And this being an experimental aircraft, as previously pointed out, it never really carried passengers other than flight crews and technicians, engineers, test equipment. Oh, 
water tanks so they could shift the ballast around, simulate different loadings and centers of gravity. Of course this being an early 747 it's not nearly as long as many of the later production models which were stretched out considerably longer than this. Still a very long airplane. And this one was uh, apparently used for testing the uh, capabilities of the aircraft as a refueling aircraft. The trailing static cone mechanism, which is used to measure static air pressure and true airspeed while in flight. if uh, additional pillars on this thing can be removed. It looks like they've got a left and a right section that they apparently can swing the airplanes through one way or another to get them in and out of here. I wouldn't be surprised if they put the landing gear up on carts that can be swung around in different directions to finesse them out through the openings. This is the electrical and electronics compartment or E and E bay of a 727 located below the main cabin floor and behind the nose wheel or the uh, nose wheel gear well. It houses the major electrical components that control fire detection, navigation, cabin pressure and numerous other systems on the aircraft. Let's go through the 727. More of the DC-2. The 
presidential thrones back here. Wish they were all this big. This aft galley served the staff and members of the press corps. This particular aircraft is really known as SAM 970. Of course, they're not really called Air Force One unless they're carrying the president at the moment. This particular aircraft was used on Eisenhower's trip to Europe, August and September 1959. Eisenhower's trip to the east, December 1959. And that doesn't mean the east coast. <laughs> Eisenhower's trip to South America in 1960. Khrushchev's U.S. tour in 59, Kennedy's trip to Key West, 61, Kennedy's trip to Vienna in 61, LBJ's flight to Dallas in 63, Kissinger's Paris trips in 1970 and 71, and Nixon's trip to China in 72. This aircraft had fold-down bunks. I think you'd have to sleep with your knees a little bit. That's pretty short. there would have been a solid wall here, but they've got a plexiglass wall put in now. This is where we have meetings. Yeah. Not as cool as I thought. This is a cool place. <coughs> it is kind of cool. bigger presidential commode back here. And the front galley that was used for all the important people. Communication center. Some safes, secret codes, etc. Front crew lavatory, and of course the cockpit. Flight engineer, navigator, and uh, the two pilots. Looks like they might only be letting the uh, people through the Concorde a few at a time.
really small passenger windows and a low ceiling. leaving the pavilion, going back through the space gallery. We've seen pretty much everything at this point. They still have what they call the tower, which is really just an overlook onto the runway here at Boeing Field. Pay a quick visit to that. taking a run up to the tower at Boeing Field, which has some exhibits, and a slow elevator. Yeah, 
see an aircraft movie or film at the W.M. Allen Theater. And it did start raining. Well, it was a good visit at the Boeing Museum of Flight. Really a popular place today on Saturday. Looked like the parking lot was basically full and I bet they were using the overflow parking as well. There are a couple of more aircraft here stuck away in corners. That's a Fiat G91 Pan and a MiG-17 just out here in the corner. Well, even though the weather's crappy, and you know, I always thought Seattle was a beautiful area, and in many ways I wouldn't mind living in an area like this, but it's the weather that deters me. There's too much weather like this. Turn right at the traffic light. Turn right on Corson Avenue South. 